Okay, yes, let's get started. We'll talk about microprogramming today. It's one of the best ways of designing a automatic, automatic calculating machine, as Morris Wilkes put it in 1951. So it should be, it should be a lot of fun, I think. It's a, it's a different way of designing machines compared to single cycle microarchitectures. It's a very elegant way, as you will see. But before that, what, uh, basically, we're going into multi-cycle microarchitectures that focus on microprogramming. There are other ways of implementing multi-cycle microarchitectures, but we're not going to talk about them in detail. You can imagine how they could be done. And then we'll go into pipelining in the next lecture. And then we'll cover a lot of issues in pipelining, data and control dependence handling, state maintenance and recovery, precise exceptions. And then we'll go into out-of-order execution, and we'll go into issues in out-of-order execution. How do you handle load stores, for example? So you'll get a really good idea of how a processor actually works, state-of-the-art state processor works, assuming you stick and stay in the class. I hope the people who are not present are doing their homework. Well, I hope they're, they'll come, but <laughs> persevere. It helps. In the end, you'll be rewarded greatly. <laughs> Okay, a reminder on assignments. Lab 2 is due next Friday, February 6th. So hopefully you get, you already started. Homework 1 is due today. How many of you are done with it? That's good. That's actually good. I guess if we ask the question for, to people who are not here, hopefully the answer is yes and they have, an, they have another excuse for not coming. And homework 2 is out. Who has gotten started? No one yet? Okay. <laughs> this will be fun too. And remember, this is all for your benefit, labs and homeworks. Actually, the entire course is for your benefit. So hopefully you're not doing it just for the grades. Uh, homeworks especially so, because homeworks, actually homeworks, if you have not realized, uh, a lot of the questions are similar to what we've asked in the past. You can actually find the solutions. If the goal is to get a grade, you can just copy the solutions from spring 2014 or spring 2013. There are some changes to the questions, but you can find the solutions, basically. But the goal is not to just bark back the solution. The goal is really to understand what's going on and learn the material. So it's really for your benefit. I don't, I, I don't care as much about the grade that you get in homework. Get a good grade, of course, but definitely understand it. And all assignments will uh, probably take time, even the homeworks. Actually, we have a lot of questions on homework, too. But the goal is for you to learn very well. And we added the refresh question. Oh, I shouldn't go fast. <laughs> How many of you enjoy the refresh question? Yeah? Yeah, some of you. That's good. And that was for your benefit, again. In the, in the grand scheme of things, if you don't get that question right, it doesn't matter, right, in this course. It's 0.01% of the grade or something like that. But it's for your benefit to actually explore and figure out how dig information on how you can get the values for uh, power consumption of a refresh, right, of a single refresh. And there may be different ways of answering the question. You could do your own research. Okay, that said, hopefully, hopefully you're enjoying the course. Uh, it'll be hard work, as I said. I cannot promise a course without hard work, but it'll be, it'll be fun. You'll learn a lot. And this is lab one grades. I like the big bar over here toward the back. So a lot of people got hundreds, greater than 90, uh, 90, which is good actually. Keep it up for the labs. As I said, this was one of the easier labs, I think. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you'll keep it up. And if you haven't uh, gotten more than 90 out of 100, please try to complete the lab. That also helps. And if you have questions, ask the TAs. Okay, uh, lab assignment two, uh, there's extra credit for it. This is in your handout. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but whatever we will cover in this lecture will help your extra credit a lot because uh, we, lab assignment two, if you remember, it's a single cycle implementation of the MIPS ISA or the subset of the MIPS ISA you're implementing. Uh, and the, in the extra credit portion, we're asking that you do a microcoded implementation of the MIPS ISA, similar to what we will discuss in class. We're not going to specify any particular details of this, so you can be creative. This is a design extra credit, if you will. So you can enjoy designing a microcoded machine. 
Of course, the microcode implementation should execute the same programs as your ordinary implementation does, and you should demo it by the normal lab deadline. You can certainly use your extra days if you wish. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it because you will probably use your extra days for later labs. And this is a, it's actually a hefty assignment. You'll, I know you're not here for grades, but you can still get an additional 4% on top of the course grade. So you'll go up to 104% if you do everything perfectly. And please document what you've done and demonstrate well. That's true for any assignment. So sometimes we ask design questions in the exam or homework or labs. You should definitely do document what you do. State your assumptions really well. State how you arrived at the solutions because you can get partial credit that way. And as a hint, uh, toward the end of this lecture, hopefully we'll get to it, uh, there is a microcoded MIPS implementation in the Patterson and Hennessy book. I believe it's in one of the appendices. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk about it when, when we get to it. So you can actually use that implementation also. Although I do not believe it's as elegant as what I'm going to describe in this lecture for LC3B. Okay, there are some readings for today. Uh, these, are, these are going to be useful in today's lecture, actually. So maybe if you have a laptop, you can look at them. But I'm going to show you the Appendix A. That's LC3B ISA. How many of you have looked at these readings? Okay, that's good. Appendix C, you should definitely do this reading, which is the microarchitecture of the LC3B, which is what we will discuss today. Uh, and this Appendix D is really the microcode implementation. And uh, this appendix in Patterson and Hennessy actually uh, contains the microcode implementation of MIPS. And the optional reading is uh, the paper that introduced it all. It's Morris Wilkes. Actually, it's a, it's a speech in which he introduced the microcode machines. It's two and a half pages. Nice. We'll, we'll, we'll get to it as well. Next lecture, we'll start pipelining. Uh, these are the recommended readings. Uh, this is uh, more of an assignment, uh, but we're not going to do the pipeline LC3B microarchitecture, but this will give you an idea of how you can pipeline the microcode implementation. So I would recommend that you look at these. And I guess I didn't pick the link over here. It's S, S14, but S15 also works. But it doesn't matter because the link hasn't changed. <laughs> Fundamentals rarely change. Which is interesting, right? <laughs> uh, and the Patterson and Hennessy chapter uh, 4.5 through 4.8. Okay, let's recap the last lecture a little bit and then delve into all of this. Uh, remember, we started microarchitecture in the last lecture. We talked about a very basic instruction processing engine, the single cycle microarchitecture. We talked about the differences from multi cycle, which we will cover in detail today. We talked about the instruction processing cycle, which is the phases an instruction goes through. Uh, to be processed. We talked about data path versus control logic. Uh, we talked uh, uh, talk about hardwired versus microprogram control. We're going to go into microprogram control a lot today. We talked briefly about performance analysis. Uh, I introduced the execution time equation. You remember that? It's execution time equals number of instructions times cycles per instruction times clock cycle time. And you can actually change those independently depending on what microarchitecture you're designing. Talk about power analysis a little bit, dynamic power equation. Remember the equation that I showed? Dynamic power equals activity factor times capacitance times voltage square times frequency. That's actually the dynamic power. I didn't make it clear in the last lecture, but it's really the dynamic power consumption. There's also some other sort of power, which is the leakage power or static power that gets consumed regardless of whether or not the circuits, circuit operates. Right? Even if you're not switching the circuit, there's some uh, charge that leaks in the transistor because we cannot manufacture these transistors perfectly. As a result, you get this leakage. And that leakage is, you can think of it as more or less constant except it's dependent on temperature. It actually has an exponential dependence on temperature. If the temperature increases, you get significant increase in leakage. So power is really a combination of how much dynamic power you're spending by activating, by keeping the circuit busy, by, for example, uh, doing additions plus how much static power there is. And if you, even if you're not using the circuit, you, you actually spend static power. So if your execution time is long, given uh, any time unit, you're spending some constant amount of static power, unless you use some mechanisms to mitigate it. This is called power gating. So you can power gate some parts of your processor, especially if you're not using them. As a result, you can reduce the leakage. Okay. Maybe we'll get to it at some point. 
But keep, keep power in mind also, as you had mentioned in the last lecture. That's an important part of design today. Okay, after that we did a detailed walkthrough of a single cycle MIPS implementation. So hopefully you remember that. Even if you don't remember that, you will actually do it in lab one. We talked about the data path, control logic, and we did some critical path analysis, a very rough one. We, we, uh, we ensured that the MUXs had zero delay. That's not a good analysis, but for analysis purposes, it, it, make, it may make sense. Uh, and we talked about microarchitecture design principles. So I'll start with those a little bit. Uh, this is where I ended, I think. I, I gave you a key system design principle, if you remember, right? What was it? Yes. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Yes, great. <laughs> It's a simple principle, but it works. And you remember Albert Einstein says, everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. Which is really a really good quote, actually, because if you make it too simple, it may not be useful, right? And keep it low cost. I think this, is, this actually follows from simple. While as long as you're within your design point, as long as you're satisfying your design point, it's always a good idea to minimize cost. Basically, keep it as little cost as you can. And this, you remember this quote, right? Any fool can do something for a dollar, but an engineer does it for a dime. That's and in the end, uh, uh, if, you, if you have two things of the same functionality, you'll pick the one that is low cost, right? That makes sense. I, I think that's the basic law of economics, <laughs> assuming you're rational. <laughs> and most economics today assumes that people are rational. Okay, for more, see Butler Lampson's uh, Hints for Computer System Design. A little bit about Butler Lampson. I rushed, rushed through it last time. But Butler Lampson is one of the pioneers of personal computers. He actually designed the, er, one of the earliest personal computers, the Alto computer, Xerox Alto. How many of you know the name? You do? That's great. And he received a Turing Award for, some of his, uh, for, for those designs, for those early designs. So uh, his, his Hints for Computer System Design comes from a lot of experience, actually. And I would recommend that. Okay, these were the microarchitecture design principles. I'll briefly go through these again. Critical path design, you remember that. Basically find and decrease the maximum combination of logic delay and break a path into multiple cycles if it takes too long. Bread and butter or common case design. Spend time and resource on where it matters. Basically spend time on the common case. If only 0.01% of your time is spent executing the floating point divide, maybe it's not a good idea to optimize spend most of your design time on optimizing the floating point divide, right? Uh, balanced design, balance the instruction and data flow through hardware components. Design to eliminate bottlenecks. Basically, balance the hardware for work. You remember this also. Don't fetch 200 instructions if you have only five execution units, right? Fetch five instructions per cycle, maybe. Okay, and we've uh, gone over how, how does a single cycle microarchitecture fare in light of these principles, and we've said that it actually violates them all. And you can remember that. Uh, you can go back to the lecture to think about why. Well, first of all, you cannot do a criti good critical path design, right? You cannot even break a, 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 an instructions execution into multiple cycles because it's a single cycle design. You cannot optimize for the common instructions as well. And you cannot actually, you need to provide the maximum number of resources that an instruction, that any instruction needs during execution, right? If an instruction needs five ALUs during execution, you cannot get away with a single ALU, right? Because everything is combinational within one cycle. Unless you have a really cool circuit design trick you come up with. Okay. So we motivated multi-cycle microarchitectures because we want something that actually obeys these principles, hopefully. And the basic idea is very simple. The goal is to let each instruction take close to, I say close to, but let's ignore close to for now, only as much as time, as much time as, really, as it really needs, right? by dividing the processing uh, into multiple cycles. And the idea is determine the clock cycle time independently of the instruction processing time. Before we coupled these, now we're going to decouple that. Uh, each instruction takes as many cycles as it needs to take. And we have multiple state transitions per instruction. And the states followed by each instruction is different now. Make sense? Because the instructions are doing different things, right? And uh, I have given you this slide earlier. Remember, the ISA specifies abstractly what the architectural state prime should be given an instruction and the architectural state, state beginning that before that instruction. And microarchitecture actually implements 
how, how that architectural state is transformed to architectural state prime. And we're going to look at the second choice, where we're going to take multiple steps, multiple cycles, to actually get to that architectural state prime that's specified by the ISA. So if you look at this, this is an easier way of looking at it. You start with an architectural programmer visible state at the beginning of an instruction. You do, you process, the uh, machine process part of the instruction in one clock cycle, produces some microarchitectural state here, and then it processes part of the uh, instruction in the next clock cycle, produces some other microarchitectural state, and then processes uh, part of the instruction in the next clock cycle, dot, dot, dot. Eventually, it produces an architectural state prime. Right? That's basically it, multi-cycle machines. So let's take a look at the benefits of this. If you, if you design a machine without going into the implementation, what are, what are the benefits you would get? First of all, you can keep reducing the critical path independently of the worst case processing time of any instruction, right? If an instruction is taking too long, well, break it into multiple cycles, right? You can actually say, my clock cycle will be one gigahertz, and I'm going to design everything to achieve that clock cycle. It's easy. Uh, you can optimize the number of states it takes to execute important instructions, right? If an, if an instruction, like add, for example, is uh, executed 90% of the time, you can optimize the number of cycles it takes to execute the add, right? You can focus your attention to only that add. That's, uh, that's good for a common case design. And you don't need to provide more capability or resources than really needed, right? If an instruction does, let's say, five adds during its life cycle, during its cycle stages, you can get away with a single adder. Because you can use that adder in multiple different clock cycles, right? You can latch the results. So you can actually do a much more balanced design and low-cost design as a result as well. So, uh, yeah, this is what I said basically. If an instruction, uh, an instruction that needs any resource actually, it doesn't need to be an adder. It could be memory also, right? You don't need to add another port to memory, perhaps. You can use the, that same port again in the next clock cycle. You don't require multiple X's to be implemented. Yes. Basically, this is what I said. You at least a more efficient hardware. Okay, let's take a look at the performance analysis again. I'm going to go through this quickly because we've already seen this. Single cycle microarchitecture performance, CPI is always one, regardless of the instruction, right? And clock cycle time as a result is long, whereas multi-cycle microarchitecture, CPI is different for each instruction. Remember, CPI is cycle per instruction. How many cycles it takes to execute an instruction? Average CPI is hopefully small because you optimize the design such that instructions that are encountered more are taking fewer clock cycles. Uh, and uh, so you can reduce both the CPI. Uh, well, the CPI is actually higher uh, compared to multi-cycle microarchitecture, right? But you can optimize it. And clock cycle time you can definitely reduce compared to single cycle microarchitecture. And you have two degrees of freedom to optimize, which is really nice, actually. Okay, and we're, we're going to think about how to optimize it. So let's take a closer look at the multi-cycle microarchitecture. Any questions so far? Is this interesting? Yes, hopefully. Okay, it'll become even more interesting with, with Maurice's ideas. So the, basically, how do we implement this multi-cycle microarchitecture? There are many choices, and you can imagine many choices, but I'll talk about the microprogram design choice, basically. This is a paper that actually introduced the concept of microcoded microprogram machines. Morris Wilkes is the proponent. He actually started the domain of microprogramming as a result of this. Uh, it's interesting that he, he's, he called this the best way, right? That's kind of strong. <laughs> One could argue it's arrogant also, right? <laughs> well, but it's, it's actually a very elegant way. Maybe it's not the best way today, but it's a very, very elegant way of designing. And he, he also received the Turing Award, by the way. I guess we're covering a lot of people who receive Turing Awards or Nobel Prizes. Okay, so what is the key idea for this? Key idea is actually really simple. You can implement the process instruction step as a finite state machine that sequences between states and eventually returns back to the fetch instruction state. And the state is defined by the control signals asserted in it. The control signals that you use in that state belong to that state. And the control signals for the next state are determined in the current state. And we're going to look at how these transitions happen. Remember the instruction processing cycle. This is, uh, we're going to divide this into different stages, if you will, different states. And eventually come back to the uh, fetch instruction state. But this doesn't mean that we're going to divide everything into six states, right? 
it really depends on which instruction. Some instruction doesn't have uh, store result state, uh, stage, for example. So we're not going to have a, a state in the finite state machine for this. So a basic multi-cycle microarchitecture divides the instruction processing cycle into states. And a stage in the instruction processing cycle can take multiple states. For example, if we go back to fetch, this could actually take 10 states. As we will see soon, it'll, it's going to take three states in the LC3B microarchitecture design we will do. Uh, and it sequences from state to state to process an instruction, which makes sense. And the behavior of the machine in a state is completely determined by the control signals in that state. And the behavior of the entire processor is specified fully by the finite state machine. And I'm going to show you a picture of the finite state machine that specifies fully the LC3B microarchitecture. So in a state, control signals actually control two things. Uh, how the data path should process the data. We've seen this in the single cycle microarchitecture, right? We generated some control signals, and those control signals control the MUXs, ALUs, registers in that data path. And how to generate the control signals for the next clock cycle. So this is going to be a little bit different from single cycle machines, because in the single cycle machine, we were generating the control signals that we need in the same cycle, right? But now we're going to generate the control signals for the next clock cycle. In the current clock cycle, we're going to use the control signals to generate the control signals for the next clock cycle. So let me give you some terminology. Actually, uh, you should read Appendix C. Appendix C contains a lot of this terminology, uh, but slides also contain the terminology. So we're going to call control signals associated with the current state a micro-instruction. Now, this will become apparent soon, why we call it a micro-instruction. It's really a micro-instruction, but it's a small instruction. It basically uh, tells, uh, instructs the machine what to do in that particular state. And the act of transitioning from one state to another is called micro-sequencing. Now, we're really sequencing between micro-instructions. This is also the act of determining the next state and the micro-instruction for the next state. What are my control signals in the next state? So we'll have a micro-sequencer hardware structure that actually does this. You can think of this as branching to some place in the micro, uh, some different micro-instruction. So this is like, uh, you can think of this as programming the hardware also, right? We're, we're going to program the hardware using micro-instructions. Control store, control store stores control signals for every possible state in the machine. This is basically a set of micro-instructions. It stores the micro-instructions for the entire uh, FSF, finite state machine. And I'll give you a pretty picture soon. Microsequencer, I already told you, it determines which set of control signals will be used in the next clock cycle, basically the next state. And we'll also have a data path. This is the control. Right? Okay. Before we go into uh, a design, uh, let me emphasize one thing. We've discussed this actually before uh, in the previous lecture. Uh, as I said, the control signals, or the micro-instruction, let's call it a micro-instruction, for the current states control two things. One is the data path. What does the data path do to the data? The second is generation of the control signals uh, for the next cycle, or micro-instruction for the next cycle. Which micro-instruction I'm going to use in the next cycle. And the data path and micro-sequencer operate concurrently. I'm going to show you this in a, in a little bit. So a question arises, and I've answered this in the last lecture, actually. Why, do we, why should we not generate control signals for the current cycle in the current cycle? Any thoughts? Yes? Exactly. It'll increase your critical path. So microprogramming allows you to actually generate the control signals in the previous cycle. Well, why would it lengthen the clock cycle? Because you need the control signals to do processing in the data path, right? So let's take a look at the supplemental figures with my beautiful handwriting. Yes, I, I used to be able to write better. Okay, this is a clock cycle. I'm just joking, it's not that beautiful. <laughs> this is a clock cycle. Uh, at the beginning of the cycle, uh, we do processing in data path for cycle n and generate the control signals for cycle n plus 1. So you have the entire clock cycle to generate the control signals for this cycle because you don't need these control signals. You've already generated the control signals for this cycle in the previous cycle. And at the end of the cycle, you latch the results of the current cycle n and control signals needed for the next cycle n plus 1. As a result, you can do the processing right away in the n plus 1. A bad clock cycle is a bad idea, and people have done this mistake many times, actually, which you shouldn't do. Learn from the past, look backward, right? 
This is the alternative. You start generating the control signals for cycle N while you're in cycle N. And after that, you start processing for the data path for cycle N, which lengthens the crack cycle, as you said. Right? Because step one is dependent on step zero. And ste if step zero takes non-zero time, and believe me, it does, generating control signals always takes non-zero time, uh, clock cycle increase unnecessarily. And this violates the critical path design principle, clearly. So don't do this. Try to minimize this. Control store should not be on your critical path in most designs. But having said that, we will see, uh, and, we have, and we have seen in the past, uh, past lecture, there are some control signals that you need in the current cycle that you cannot generate in the previous cycle, right? Because they're dependent on the processing that happens in the data path. In that case, well, you either break the clock cycle, you either lash the control signal that you generate and have another clock cycle, or maybe it does, it's not on the critical path, right? And we'll see that. Remember the branch condition signal from the single cycle data path that was dependent on the ALU results that computed the branch condition. Okay. So let me, so we're gonna start uh, the LC3D control and data path. I'll just get this ready. But this is a basic uh, microprogram machine. You have the control store, and these, this is the micro instruction for the current cycle. Let's call those control signals. And these control signals feed into the data path to, uh, to basically control what's going on in the data path elements. And some of the control signals go back into the control, uh, this actually not only the control store, but also the micro sequencer that determines what is the next address in the control store. Some of the control signals go into the con uh, control engine, if you will, to determine what are the next control signals. So you have lashed the current control signals and you're using those control signals to operate on the data path and also determine the next state. And if you look at this figure, there are also some signals coming from the data path going into the control. These are the control signals. Uh, these are the signals that are used to determine the next state. And sometimes your next state is different, right? For example, we, we will see actually, this R is the ready bit for the memory. If the memory is not ready, you stay in the current state. So keep accessing memory. BEN is branch enabled. If the branch is not taken, you do something. If the branch is taken, you do something else. Basically, your state is different depending on whether branch is enabled or not. Right? So these signals come from the data path as a result of the processing in the data path, and they determine the next state. As a result, you need this. So we're going to look deeper into each, both of these structures, control and data path. Let me actually try to make this work, hopefully without wasting time, because it's, it'll be useful for you to see both. Document camera. And voila, wow. it worked. It's good to have it work the first time. So I think I've already so, uh, told you this actually, and you can see all of it, that's good. What determines the next state control signals? The control signals that you need in the next state. First of all, what's happening in the current stock clock cycle is important. These are the nine control signals coming from the control block. If you look over here, uh, yeah, these are the nine control signals. They determine what's happening in the current clock cycle in the control store. It determines the next state also. What, what are your control signals going to be in the next state? And we'll see why, because the next state is dependent on which state you're currently in, right? And we'll see what exactly those uh, nine control signals are. The instruction that's being executed, obviously that determines your next state, right? And if you look over here, IR 15 through 11, coming from the data path. Basically, if, if you remember the LC3B microarchitecture, well, LC3B ISA, sorry. IR is the instruction register in the microarchitecture. And it's basically a 16-bit register that latches the instruction and if you look at the instruction specification in LC3B, the top four bits, uh, 15 through 12, specify the opcode. And there's also a bit 11 that's going to be useful because it actually uh, relates to JSR, uh, what, whether it's a JSR or JSRR. So it's kind of an extended opcode, if you will. Basically, these are important to determine your next state because they actually specify what your instruction is. You need, for your control to be successful, you need to know what your instruction is, right? 
Whether the condition of a branch is met if the instruction being processed is a branch, you need that to determine your next state if the instruction is a branch, obviously. Oh, what did I do? Okay. This is the BEN bit coming from the data path over here. And whether the memory operation is completing in the current cycle if one is in progress. That's coming from memory, this R bit over here. It's not connected to the memory, but it's coming from memory. Okay? Okay. So now we're going to go into it uh, soon. So uh, I talked about the state machine, right? The state machine completely determines the behavior of the LC3D microarchitecture. And in turn, the be entire behavior is really determined by the 35 control signals that you see over here, 26 over here, 39 uh, over here, 35 control signals. That, that determines what your machine is going to do in this cycle and what the next state will be in the next cycle. And the additional seven bits coming from uh, the data path. Right? If you calculate, this is seven. And 35 control signals completed describe the state of this control structure. Which means that we can actually completely describe the behavior of the LC3B as a state machine or a directed graph of nodes and arcs. You all know what state machines are, right? Finite state machines. You have nodes, one corresponding to each state, and you have arcs showing flow from each state to the next states. And if you look at uh, the figure from Pat and Patel that gives you one state machine you can generate to completely describe the behavior of uh, LC3B. How did we do this? Zoom. Oh. Let's zoom out is better, right? Yes. Can everybody see this? No? You cannot read it? Well, I'll zoom into the relevant state later on. But this is basically this. This is a state machine that can execute all of these instructions over here. It has only 31 states, which is nice. And each state must be uniquely specified, obviously, in a state machine. This is done by means of state variables. State variable is the address of the state. If you look at it, look over here. It's, this is state 33. This is state 25. We're going to use that actually as the address of the control store also to get the micro instruction. Some examples, uh, state 18 and 19 correspond to the beginning of the instruction processing cycle. Let me zoom into it a little bit more. Now you can see it? Good. So this state is state 18 and 19. They're the same state. They're duplicated for some reason, for reasons you will understand. Uh, and that is the beginning of the instruction processing cycle. Fetch phase, if you will, consists of these three states over here, 18, 19, 33, and 35. At the end of these three states, the instruction register, IR, actually has uh, the contents of memory specified by the program counter. Right? Memory, uh, the contents of memory, uh, which has the address uh, program counter. And we will see that also. What is that? Oh, that's the decode phase. That's state 32. So this state 32 over here that you can see is actually the decode phase. And after decode, the machine jumps to a different state depending on the opcode. As you can see, it's a 16-way branch over here because there are 16 possible instructions. It's actually cute. It's simple, right? You can design it on your own. You can come up with a different design for the state machine. This is one design we will look at. Okay, I, I think I replicated over here. So let me ask you some questions quickly. How many cycles does the fastest instruction take in the state machine? I don't think you can answer that question unless you have your own copy. Yes? Four. Four. Let's calculate. Well, I think you counted this one. <laughs> so one, one to uh, start the fetch, basically here, uh, the program counter goes to the memory address register and program counter gets incremented. And memory gives you the result into the MDR. And MDR, uh, the result, MDR is memory data register. We'll see that in the data path soon. And memory data register uh, is put into the instruction register. So that's three states over here, right? To actually get the... Actually, I will give you uh, the data path also very quickly so that you don't wonder what these things are. So if you look at the first state, it says 
program counter goes into M MAR. So always, you always state the state, uh, design the state machine based on a data path also, right? So if you look at this, program counter needs to go to MAR. If you look at MAR, MAR is the memory address register. You need to access memory. And you need to actually access memory at program counter. So somehow, the control signals need to bring the program counter on this bus, it's a single bus design, into the MAR. That's the first state. And also at the same time, PC gets incremented. PC gets PC plus two. Somehow, this needs to be enabled in the control signal. And we will see how that gets enabled by setting the right control signal. But okay, let's go back to the question that I'm asking. This, this hopefully gives you an idea of uh, what these mean over here. The question is, how many cycles does the fastest instruction take? Well, all of the instructions need to go through these states because you need to bring uh, the instruction bytes into the instruction register, right? These three states, all of the instructions need to go through. If you want to look at where the instruction register is, it's somewhere over here. Yeah, there it is. That's the instruction register. Eventually, at the end of fetch, you should have the instruction bytes or 16 bits instruction uh, inside this instruction register. And after that, this state decodes the instruction. So every instruction needs to be decoded. And it needs to be executed, right? So all instructions go through these four states. And I guess the shortest, the fastest instruction goes through one more state, right? In this case, it's an add. Ignore RTI right now. It goes to some different state that's not specified over here. And these are uh, unimplemented instructions, actually. So the fastest instruction actually goes to one, two, three, four, five states. But that doesn't actually, that's not a good answer to my question. Because I asked cycles, right? I didn't ask states. Exactly. Exactly, yes. So it depends on how long the memory access takes. So it depends is a good answer, as long as you tell what it depends on. So it takes at least one, two, uh, let's do one, two, three, four, four plus memory access cycles. That's, that's a good answer for an exam. Because you can actually stay in that state for hundreds of cycles, right? Until the memory decides, oh, I'm ready, I'm giving you the data, which could take a long time. You're in that state. Okay. How many cycles does the slowest instruction take? Well, you can answer it in a similar way. Basically, you find the instruction that takes the longest number of states, highest number of states. And in this case, there are many of them. So if you look at this, uh, plus the memory accesses. And I'll give you this answer, basically, some instructions require two memory accesses, one for fetch, one for data access over here, uh, and also some number of states, so one, two, three, four, five, five plus two memory accesses, basically. Okay, you can do that uh, after, after class. Why does the branch take as long as it takes in the finite state machine? Well, maybe you'll understand this later on, but let's take a look at it. So if you look at it, the branches uh, this is actually interesting. We didn't cover how branches work in LC3B. But let's take a look at it, uh, because this is a way of implementing branches that's different from MIPS. Remember, in MIPS, uh, how does a branch work? You have a branch that's testing a condition, right? And the condition is determined by comparing two registers, right? BEQ, for example, compares two source registers. And if they're equal, you take the target address. Well, it's different uh, in LC3B. In LC3B, there is no register comparison specified by the branch instruction. What the branch instruction does is, it looks at these N, Z, P bits that are part of your architectural state. That's the condition codes. These are called the condition codes. If I had a place to write, I would write condition codes somewhere. <laughs> well, you can write it. So these are condition codes that are part of the architectural state, and some other instruction sets these condition codes. The job of the branch is to check the condition codes. And the branch can be specified in different ways. For example, BRN is checking whether the N condition code is set. And if the N condition code is set, you jump to the address that's calculated as a target address. And how do you calculate the target address? That's PC plus left shifted sign extended 9-bit offset over here. Does that make sense? So the this is a machine with condition codes. x86 is a machine that has condition codes, for example. It operates very similarly to this. In x86, you can 
specify a branch on the zero condition code. If the zero condition code is set, then you branch. Otherwise, you go, fall through to the next instruction. And some other instruction sets the condition code. So how do you actually set the condition code? You can, for example, do a subtract of two registers. And that subtract can actually set the condition code depending on the result of the subtract. If it's negative, you set, uh, it sets the negative condition bit, code bit. If it's zero, if it's positive, it sets the corresponding bits. Make sense? So now you have two instructions. Uh, whereas in MIPS, you have a single instruction that does both of the things, right? Okay. So this branch actually, this is the operation of the branch. If n bit is set, n condition code is set, and if we're testing n, or if z condition code is set and we're testing z, testing the z condition code, or if p condition code is set and we're testing the p condition code, then we jump to the target address. pc gets the target address. Otherwise, PC gets PC plus 4 implicitly. Okay? So why does... If we look at how we implement it in this uh, finite state machine over here, what happens is... this is, Some designer made this choice. Basically, there's a BEN register. BEN register gets this calculation. Make sense? This is the calculation that I showed you over here. Basically, the branch test, branch condition evaluation. And n bit actually comes from IR11, z bit comes from instruction register 10, p bit comes from instruction register bit 9. So in this cycle, while you're decoding the instruction, you don't even know if it's a branch at this point, right? While you're decoding, you're concurrently evaluating this and setting the BEN bit. If it evaluates the true, that means that, and if the instruction is a branch, later on you're going to jump to the target address. Otherwise, you'll stay. So let, and here we have calculated it. Assume that now you go to the branch, <laughs> which is state zero over here. Uh, interestingly, it's, late, it's, it's the state variable is state zero. The purpose of the state is solely to test whether the branch enable bit is one or zero. That's it. And if it's zero, you go back to the over here. If it's one, you calculate the target address and go over here. Make sense? So here it takes as long as it takes because some designer made the choice that you don't want to wait for the branch evaluation bits to settle. Right? This may not be a good design, by the way. You can always question this design. You can actually potentially uh, uh, do, do other things. Actually, uh, but basically, this is done over here such that uh, branch condition evaluation does not get on the critical path, assuming it may be on your critical path, assuming this calculation is on your critical path, right? Does that make sense? How can you actually optimize this even better if, if you want to add more stuff into the data path? You could potentially evaluate this target address early on, right? Right? Because there's nothing over here in this target address that's dependent on the processing of... Uh, you know the PC at this point. You can get the offset at that point. And if you have an adder to do the addition, which you do actually, perhaps, you can actually calculate the target address early. Okay, so you can actually reduce the number of states in LC3D. But we're going to assume that this is, the, uh, this is what we have in the state machine. So what determines the clock cycle time in this machine? You can answer this one. I'm not going to give you this one. Yes? It's simple. It's not actually a trick question. <laughs> it's the longest critical path delay for any state, right? It's basically, now you need to figure out which state takes the longest critical path delay to produce its result, and that's it. Okay. So if you look at this data path, let's go back to the data path now. We're going to cover this in a little bit more detail, and we're going to do some microprogramming later on. This is the microprogram control data path. Actually, it doesn't have to be microprogram control over here, but because we don't show the control store over here, you can, you can control it in some other way. But this is the data path. It's a single bus design as you see, and that's a design choice also. 
because you have a single bus, at any point, only one value can be gated on this bus. So let's take a look at this. So if you look at the data path, let me introduce you a little bit to this. This is a register file over here, general purpose register file. This is a program counter. This is a program counter increment. It's plus two because the instructions are two bytes in LC3B. This is the PC MUX. If you remember the single cycle MIPS design, PC MUX, we actually uh, made, uh, made the PC MUX large, right? Because the target address can come from different places. Yes? Oh, okay. Oh, oh, I see. How about this? <laughs> Can you see it? <laughs> yes, you're right. Because you're, you're far from there. Thank you. If I do it again, let me know again, because I'm, I'm much more used to these blackboards. So this is the register file. This is PC plus two logic to increment the PC. This is the PC mux that, that basically takes input as different potential target addresses that can go into PC depending on what kind of jump or branch instruction you have. Uh, this is some address calculation logic over here. This is actually, uh, let's see, this is actually the address calculation logic. Effective addresses and uh, target addresses are generated over here depending on different instructions as you can see over here. Let's see, this is the ALU, this is the shifter, it has a shift instruction. This is the register file and register file uh, ALU's second input can come from either the register file uh, or an immediate that supplies. If you follow this, this is the immediate, right? This is sign extended, uh, five bits immediate. And control logic determines which one to use. Remember in the single cycle MIPS, that was uh, the difference between I type and R type instruction. So if it's an I type instruction, this control logic selected the immediate, right? So you'll need something similar, some similar signal to generate for this, depending on the opcode. And if you look at this, it's a single cycle, a single uh, bus design. And this is the other side of the bus. This is the memory side. You have the memory address register over here. If you want to access memory, you need to load the memory address register. And you need to set the write bits. You can do, you should do enable the memory if you're accessing memory. And you have write enable bits to memory. And you have two bits because you can, you can write uh, either it's, it's a word addressable memory in this case. Uh, you can write either both bytes or one of the bytes. You can do store word or store byte instructions. And we'll, we'll, I think we'll get to these. These are some of the alignment logic uh, because if you're loading a byte and if the byte is at the top part of the word, remember the memory is word aligned, and you're loading a byte that's the most significant byte, then you need to align it at the right place to get it at the right place in the register file, depending on the ISA specification, obviously. This is the input-output logic over here. We have a keyboard and a monitor. And this is memory mapped I.O., memory mapped input-output. Basically, depending on the address you're loading from, if the address actually matches the addresses of the input-output devices, then the access actually goes to the input-output instead of the main memory. That's how memory mapped I.O. operates in existing systems also x86, for example, has memory mapped I.O. If you're, added, if you're loading a location that's mapped to the keyboard, then you're really accessing the keyboard data register. And there's also a keyboard status register, uh, which tells whether the keyboard actually has an input that's pending. And that can interrupt the machine, for example. Okay? So that gives you an overview of the data path. But let's get back to the single bus design. At any time, you want only one single value, at most one value, to be loaded on the bus, to be traveling on the bus. That's why we have all these gates. Oh, I should go back over here. Guess I get easily carried away when I see the screen. Uh, mm -hmm. So you see these gate ALU, for example, gate shift, uh, what else? Gate PC, gate MAR MUX, memory address register MUX. Uh, gating logic over here. These basically control whether the outputs whether the wire gets connected to the bus, whether the wire actually drives the bus. At any point, if you want to be correct, at most one gate signal should be, uh, uh, should, should be set, right? Otherwise, you'll get some random value. Okay. So what is the advantage? I guess I'm giving you the advantage, too bad. What is the advantage of a single bus design? It's low cost, right? 
because you have only one bus over here. Alternative was actually having multiple buses, right? You could actually have many, many buses getting connected. Actually, there is also a gate MDR if you look at it. When the memory data becomes available, you would like to gate MDR such that the data goes here and you write enable the appropriate place. Uh, you, could, you, you didn't need to do it this way. You didn't need to have a single bus. You could actually connect all of the different components that need to be connected from point to point, right? You could have lots of wires, lots of buses, if you will, that connected all possible con components that need to be connected. That's another p potential interconnect. We'll study interconnects in one of the last lectures. But this is a simple interconnect that has a single bus. Instead of having a more complicated interconnect, we have a simple interconnect. The downside, of course, everything has an upside and downside. The upside here is a single bus, simple. Well, the additional things you need are the gating signals, obviously. The upside, uh, the, uh, the downside, of course, is reduced concurrency, right? What if you want to have multiple things uh, on the bus for an instruction, right? For example, I'm making it up, but what, what if while you're uh, putting something into the register, you also want to access memory? at the same time. You have a complex instruction that does that, right? Well, you cannot do that assume if you need this bus to actually communicate the values coming from the ALU into the register and the values going into the memory address register, right? You have a resource conflict. That's the downside of the single bus design. So you could eliminate that with, with a much more powerful interconnect, but then you, you reduce the uh, advantage. Okay. The control signals, the 26 control signals, uh, determine what happens in the current cycle. And you can see, actually, all the 26 control signals somewhere here. For example, load register is one control signal that says whether the register file is write-enabled or not. Load PC is another control signal uh, that, uh, that instructs uh, whether the program counter should be loaded in the cycle or not. And you can see many other control signals. ALUK, for example, that's the function of the ALU that determines the function of the ALU. Gate shift, that's another control signal, whether the output of the shifter should be gated onto the bus. Okay, So the control logic sets these control signals. The micro-instruction that's produced at the end of the previous clock cycle has these control signals set to particular values depending on the state. Okay. So table C1, let me actually find it over here. Actually, I think it's the next one. No. It's this one. This lists all of the control signals over here. You can see it, right? Yeah. Anyway, you can take a look at it quickly. But we'll get back to this when we uh, look at different things. So the data path over here that I showed you is not the full data path because it's really omitting some things. And what are those some things? Those are here. That's, that's also part of the Appendix C. You can take a look at it when you look at Appendix C. But uh, one, one thing I will point out, this is, oh, where is this? Okay, this is, this is more intuitive for me. Mm, this is the destination register ID signal. It can either be IR 11 through 9 or register 7. And register 7 is actually used for jump to subroutine with linkage. It's similar to jump and link in MIPS ISA. In MIPS ISA, register 31 is the link register, right? Here, the link register is register 7. So depending on the instruction, you need to pick a destination register ID, and that's the purpose of this MUX over here that's not shown in this data path. And this DR MUX signal is a control signal, basically. Somebody needs to determine whether register 7 is going to be written or uh, whether uh, the bits that are specified by uh, instruction register 11 through 9 uh, give you the address of the register that you're going to write. I'm trying to find the... Yeah, there it is. So if you look at the ISA specification, uh, the destination register comes from 11 through 9, when you have a destination register. And register 7 is implicit. If you look at JSRR, uh, it uses register 7 as uh, a destination register for to store the program counter. Make sense? Okay. And this is the B, uh, 
branch-enabled logic that we've discussed earlier. You need to have some logic for that. And there's also the SR1, SR1 mux. Where should the source registry one come from? And you've actually seen this. This actually should go under SR1 mux. In the MIPS data path, remember, we also had an SR1 mux, which uh, actually we, we also have the destination register mux too. So that's true for the MIPS data path. In the single cycle MIPS data path, remember, we had some muxes to select the ID of the source register as well as the destination register. So you have the same muxes here. So it's a very fundamental thing. Any ISA you design, you need something like this because you cannot perfectly align. Uh, you, 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 you normally need different kind of register IDs depending on the instruction. Okay. Any questions? Otherwise, I'll ask you some questions. All right, you're ready, I think. <laughs> so how does the instruction fetch happen in this data path according to the state machine? Maybe we'll look at it. Well, let, let's, let's defer this question. Because I'm going to walk through uh, some uh, some states, and we're going to write the micro microcode for these states. What is the difference between gating and loading? That's actually important. If you look at this, there are some gate PC signals, and there are some load PC, uh, load signals, right? Anybody who wants to venture? Good. Yes. That's right. Yes. Basically, gating is, you can think of it as gating is kind of combinational, right? Whereas loading is you load the sequential state elements. But gating is actually, yes, uh, it, you gate stuff on the bus, wh whatever gets on the bus. Loading, loading actually happens at the end of the clock cycle. That's the sequential part of it. Because it's really a register over here. And gating happens during the clock cycle. I'll let you think about this. Is this a small start where you can design? Just by looking at it, can you tell me? Even if you haven't seen that all before. Well, I don't think so. <laughs> That's pretty minimal. It's not the smallest though. So if you look at it, you have a plus two logic here, right? Well, you could have done it in the ALU. And you have another adder over here. Well, you could have done it on the ALU also, right? But the designer made the choice to actually duplicate some of these adders such that your critical path is not lengthened. Okay, let's look at the microprogram control and then we're going to take a break and then we're going to do some microprogramming. You guys are ready to actually program this data path? It's fun. It's real programming. There's no difference between any other kind of programming and this programming, except this is at a very low level of abstraction. So the control store, let me, yeah, the control structure looks like this, basically. I think you'll be able to see it soon. Oh, there it is, yes. That's it. It consists of three components. One is the micro instruction over here, which is the set of control signals for this state that are latched. The other is the control store, the set of all possible micro instructions belonging to all possible states. In this case, remember we have 35 control signals for each state and two to the six possible locations in the control store. We have 31 states, but somebody decided to put 64 entries in the control store because you can extend the control store this way, right? That's, a, that's another good, possible, good design choice. You, you don't, you minimize the control store while leaving room for flexibility. If you actually had only 32 entries in the control store, first of all, that would make the state transitions a little bit difficult. So your microsequencer can become more complex because you need to be able to go into different states, as you will see soon. But also, you may not be able to, you, you, have, only you have room for adding only one more state in that case, right? What if you wanted to add an instruction? Or what if you wanted to patch an instruction? We'll see the benefits of microprogramming soon. So you don't have flexibility in adding more states if you leave your control store to be really small. You want to make it small, but no smaller than needed. So I keep it simple, but no simpler than needed, right? Okay, and the third thing is the microsequencer, which determines the address 
of the control store, the six-bit address of the control store that you need to access during this cycle to generate the control signal to generate the micro instruction for the next cycle. Basically, the control operates this way. Right now, uh, in the current slot cycle, this determines, uh, this gets uh, some bits from here, gets input into the microsequencer. Microsequencer also considers what's co happening in the data path, as we've discussed. It generates the address of the next state or next micro instruction, and it, uh, the control uh, mechanism accesses the control store, gets the micro instruction, and latches it into, into this register. At the end of the clock cycle, you have all your control signals ready for the next state. Okay, I think we've already said that. Micro instructions, the control signals that control the data path and help determine the next state. It says help determine, right? So this controls the data path. These nine bits help determine the next state because these nine bits do not directly determine it because there may be something that you need to take into account that's happening in the data path. Each micro instruction is stored in a unique location in the control store. And control source is a special memory structure. It could be a ROM. It could be a read-only memory. But if you want to update it, maybe you don't want to make it a ROM, right? Or maybe you, you want to make it a programmable ROM, which you, you can program a limited number of times. A unique location is the address of the state corresponding to the micro-instruction. Remember the state machine? Basically, for, this, for states, this is state number 20. For state 20, uh, the, ad, uh, the, uh, the address, uh, at address 20 in the control store, you have the micro instruction stored for this particular state. Okay. And I think I've already harped on this. Each state corresponds to one micro instruction. And the micro sequencer determines the address of the next micro instruction, which is the next state. So I've shown you this picture. Let's take a look at this picture. Let me actually. So this is the micro sequencer. Basically, the output of it is the address of the next state. And the input is what we've shown over here. The nine bits coming out of here and seven bits coming from the data path. And this is how they're used to determine the address of the next state. And we're going to take a look at how this operates soon. It looks complicated, right? Does it? It's not actually complicated. Basically, your address of the next state if you look at this mux, let's take a look at the simple one. This IRD is a signal, is a control signal coming out of the micro instruction in the current state. Basically, this micro instruction says either IRD is set or not set. Right? Let's assume that it's set. If it's set, well, it doesn't say over here, but if IRD is 1, you actually take this input. If IRD is 0, you take whatever is coming out of this block over here. Or logic. <laughs> Blah kind of logic. So if IRD is set, the address of the next state is determined to be four bits, top four bits of the op, uh, instruction register, which is the opcode, concatenated with, at the top, zero, zero. This can give you a hint of in what state should IRD set? IRD set. Should IRD be set? Any thoughts? So if IRD is set, your next state address is dependent on the opcode. Say it again. Let me, uh, and remember this, it says opcode can take 16 values, right? So let's take a look at the state machine. This is kind of reverse engineering, if you will. What state over here can have 16 possible next states? There's only one that looks here, right? Which one? You said 32? I think you're right. <laughs> yeah, if you look at state 32, it has 16 possible next states. This is actually the decode state, right? You're decoding the instruction. And based on the value of IR1512, you're going to a different state. And how you do it? Well, the microsequencer does it this way. At that state, at the decode state, the control signal, IRD, in the micro instruction is set to 1, which means that you're going to ignore what's happening in the micro sequencer, uh, this part of the micro sequencer. The next state address will be selected as 0, 0, and 4 bits, 4 top bits of IR. If, if, what, if the instruction that you have in the instruction register is an add, your next state will be this. 
and your opcode is actually 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Right? Make sense? So this theta encoding is done such that you can actually do this multi-way jump, which is nice. Now this part, uh, the other part of the microsequencer is more complicated, but well, it's actually not that complicated. Everything is really simple. So if you're not decoding, then you need to figure out which other state you go to. And that could depend on some conditions over here. Oh, sorry. I always forget this. These condition bits tell you which conditions you should test for in this state to determine the address of the next state. For example, if the instruction you're executing, if the state you're testing the condition for is a branch, let's, let's take the memory example. If you're waiting for memory in this state, and you're actually waiting for memory in this state, right? At state 33, if the memory is not ready, you stay in state 33. If the memory is ready, you go to state 35. Right? Which means that you should be testing for this condition. Right? So condition 1 is set to be 0. Condition 0 is set to be 1. As a result, this orbit matters. Otherwise, it wouldn't matter because it's an AND gate, right? And J bits are actually bits that you can use to, uh, th these bits are coming from, where's my, yeah, the, okay, here it is. J bits are coming from here. These are actually coming from the control signal. With J bits, you can specify the unconditional current state. Unconditional next state. So these are, uh, if you're not testing any condition, or if the condition evaluates to false, you'll take J bits as the address of the next state. Make sense? And you can store that in the, mic, uh, in the control store, because it's really coming from the control store. Okay? So if the transition was unconditional, J bits are always the address of the next state. If the transition is conditional, then some of the J bits get modified to actually go to the next state. So let's take a look at the state machine again. Uh, I need to find my state machine. There you go. Let's pick one state over here. So state 35, for example. Going from state 35 to state 32 is unconditional. Right? There's no other transition here. There's one transition, which means that at state 35, in the micro instruction, you should set J bits to 32. The 5 bits, J bits should specify 32. And what is 32? 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Is that true? That's 32, right? Yes. So J bits should specify 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And clearly this transition is unconditional. So you should set the condition bits such that they are unconditional. They don't test any of these conditions. And if you actually set them to 0, 0, condition 1 and condition 0 to 0, 0, all of these AND gates will evaluate to 0. And the output of this, these 6 bits get directly connected to the J bits. OK? So that's how you do an unconditional transition. And you set IRD to 0, such that it selects this input of the MUX. That's how we transition from this state to the next state. Make sense? Okay. So we just actually figured out how to transition from this state 35 to 33. No, 32, sorry. Let's just look at the transition from 33 to 35 very quickly also. State 33. If the memory is ready, transition to 35. If the memory is not ready, transition to back to 33. So now, how do you set your J bits? Well, the microsequencer is designed cleverly such that you can do this easily, right? If you look at the distance between, uh, difference between state 33 uh, and 35, it's 2, right? Basically, bit 1 has a difference. And if you look over here, if you set the J bits to 33, because remember, uh, J bits should specify the state encoding that you should go to if the condition is not true or if the transition is unconditional. So you should set, if the condition is not true, you should stay in 33. So I'll set this to 33. 
And the condition we're testing in... Oh, you cannot see it very well here. And the condition we're testing in this state is really the arbit, right? Because we're waiting for memory. So if the, to be able to test arbit, you should set condition 1 to 0 and condition 0 to 1. So these two bits should be set to 0, 1. And now if arbit is 0, if the memory is not ready, this will be 0 and these will be valid to 0 anyway. As a result, you'll get 33 at the end, right? If the arbit is 0, you'll keep going to th state 33. If the arbit is 1, well, look what happens. This J1 is overridden with a 1. So what is 33? What is 33? That's 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, right? So it was 0 before. If the arbit is 1 and you're testing condition 0, 1 over here, as a result, you'll get a 1 out of here. And your next state address or whatever that will evaluate over here is 35. And you'd better set the IRD to select this one in that particular state, right? So that's how you actually pr microprogram. We just form pieces of the micro microprogram, microinstruction for this particular state, for state 33. You set J bits to 33, you set IRD to 0, and you set condition bits to 0, 1, to select uh, the R bits as a conditional jump. Okay. Okay. Basically, you do this for every state. Oh. So how do you actually specify the behavior of the entire machine? Well, this is how it is. This is your control store. You basically form the microinstruction, write the microinstruction for every state. And what is the microinstruction? That's the set of 35 control signals. You can see it over here, right? Okay? And we'll do that for a few states too. So microsequencer, uh, okay, we, we've actually discussed this. But uh, the purpose is to determine the address of the next microinstruction. And next address depends on nine control signals that we've discussed. J bits, we've already discussed what the purpose is, right? These are, this is the address of the next state unconditionally, or if the condition is not true. And this is uh, condition bit specify which conditions you're testing. And IRD, we already discussed, right? Whether you're in the decode state or not. This is instruction register decode. So some questions. We've already discussed this. Uh, what happens if an illegal instruction is decoded? Well, you, you jump to some crazy state. If you look at the state machine over here, you jump to these states, right? And they're not filled. So that actually should go into, there should be some states to actually throw an exception. You decode an illegal instruction. We've discussed this. We've also discussed how is variable memory latency handled, right? You stay in the same state until memory becomes ready. And how do you do the state encoding? This is actually interesting. And uh, soon after this, we'll take a break. But how do you actually encode all of these states in the state machine over here. Somebody came up with this encoding. I guess one of your assignments could have been come up with an encoding for, you will need to do this actually for the MIPS microcoded design if you do a microcoded design, if you do the extra credit. It's actually not that easy if you want to minimize things, but, uh, well, it's easy if you go into the principled way, of course. But uh, you, the goal is to minimize number of state variables or approximately the control store size, right? A good idea is to start with the 16-way branch that we've discussed, right? Decode is easier because that's the place where you're doing the most jumps in the control store. The next state has many possible next states, right? There's only another single next state. So that's kind of your constraint, if you will. That constrains what kind of addresses you can give. And 16-way jump is dependent on the IR, instruction register. So then, then you can determine the constraint tables and the states dependent on the condition bits. And you've done this in 240, hopefully. Okay, state assignments and minimization. Right? You've, you've, you've already done these. You, you work with K-maps, for example. So, okay, good. We are not going to do that in this course. But I'm assuming that you know it. Okay, so let's take a quick break uh, for three minutes again, and then we'll do some microprogramming. I guess let's you will see what we your can homework. do. So we're going to do some microprogramming just to... Ensure that you understand everything and 
you can fill in your homework. But this is going to be fun. By the way, a lot of machines actually have this. So it's not going to be a futile exercise also. So for example, the x86 machines that you have make heavy use of mic microprogramming and microcoded designs. You know how repeat OS is implemented? Well, they have microcode <laughs> for that. Okay, you can find uh, this thing that I've been following on the on the website also. So let's start with the. I don't know if I'll do LDW, but I'm definitely going to fill in some of the fetch and decode states if you're interested in that. What do you think? Shall we do it? So this is uh, what I've done over here is abstracted uh, the states that are needed for LDW. So if you look at the entire state machine, LDW, load word, consists of these states. You need to fetch the load, you need to decode the load, and then if the load, you jump to state 6, which is the opcode of the load, and then calculate the address, access memory, write the result, store the result. So load goes through all of the phases of the instruction processing cycle. It's one of the more complicated instructions, if you will. So let's at least fill in the top four states and maybe one other state. Since we're not that great on time, maybe I'll do XOR for you. Do you prefer XOR or load? Okay, XOR. Because you're going to do, well, it'll be fun. In the past years, uh, we asked you to actually fill out the entire microcode, all of the 31 states, but you're not going to do that. We had, we had some mercy this time. <laughs> It'll, be, it'll still be fun. And I'm going to give you a lot of the states, actually, so most of it will be gone. Okay, so let's do it. Uh, let's do the... Uh, let's start with state 18. Basically, what the, the goal is to actually fill out the entire control store for state 18. And state 18 and state 19 happen to be the same because that's how the addressing works out when you're jumping back from a couple, uh, to one place. So what does the state 18 do? That's the first thing we need to understand. If you look at state 18, two things happen. PC goes to memory address register, and PC gets PC plus 2 at the end of the clock cycle. Right? And what does that mean? Basically, somehow, I guess I'll need to superimpose multiple things. Or maybe, can you see this? Which one do you see better, the right or the left? This one. It's better, right? Yeah, OK, then we'll do it this way. Then I need to switch between these multiple things. I wish I was like an octopus or something. Okay. Okay. So remember, PC goes to MAR MOX because we're going to load uh, from memory uh, the address, uh, the data at the address uh, pointed to by the program counter. So we need to gate the PC and put it into the MAR. Oh, you cannot see it. Sorry. No. There you go. Is it focused? No, oh, it'll happen. You need to gate the PC and put it into the MAR. That's one thing that's happening. At the same time, PC plus 2 gets latched into load PC at the end of the clock cycle. So these two paths are exercised. So how do you ensure that that happens? Well, it's simple, basically. You just look at the control signals, right? You need to gate the PC, which means that gate PC signals should be set. So let's start looking at that. State 18 is this one. You need to make sure that you're dealing with the correct state. Where's gate PC? This one? And remember, we shouldn't gate anything else onto the bus. Otherwise, we'll get garbage on the bus. So it's easy. And then we need to load MAR, right? If you look at this, because MAR should get the PC. Uh, there's load MAR. Load MAR should be 1. And also, we're incrementing the PC and putting the value into uh, PC, which means that load PC should be set. Oh, OK. Is that load PC? Okay. And all of the other loads should not be set because we're not changing any other state according to the state specification, which means that you get zeros over here. So simple, right? PC mux should select uh, PC plus 2. So we need to set the PC mux to two bits that actually selects PC plus 2. And how do you figure out what that is? This is where being an octopus helps. Where are these? Not here. I thought I had two copies of this stuff. 
No. Maybe I lost one of them. Okay. I found it in some other place. That's good. So basically, you need to know the value that you need to give to this PC mux signal, the 2-bit signal. And that should select PC plus 2. And if you can see this, PC plus 2 is, I'm going to make the assignment 0, 0 is this one, 0, 1 is this one, 1, 0 is this one. So PC mux should be set to 0, 0. Okay, PC max is zero zero. And if you look at the rest, well, maybe all of these should be don't care, except for memory. Don't do do no harm in memory, right? Memory and I.O. should not be enabled. Oh, you cannot see it. So let's take a look at basically the rest do no harm. No state should be changed. So memory, I.O. not enabled, right? Read, write, don't care because we haven't enabled memory or I.O. Okay? And these rests, they really don't care, right? Because whatever you do over there, the results are not going to be latched anywhere. Make sense? And if you, you can confirm this by looking at some of the signals. So one of the signals over here is MAR MUX. If you look at MAR MUX, what it's doing is selecting between these two inputs of the memory that goes into memory address. Oh, no, 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 no because we wanted to get the PC. No, no, that's correct, that's correct. It's basically taking the address that's computed over here or taking some other address computation over here. These are different addressing modes, if you remember. And you can load that onto the bus and send it wherever you would like. Since we're not gating the MAR box, we don't care, right? Whatever happens over there, I don't care, okay? Okay, good. I didn't make a mistake. This is easy to make a mistake, by the way. <laughs> you need to think. Yes. That's right. So if you, well, you're not incrementing the, you, as opposed to you're loading the PC into MAR. That's right. Because the PC has a separate path going through the MA, going through the MAR, right? Yes. Right now it's just fetching. That's right. Exactly. Okay. So this is not it, though, because you have, remember, the control signals. These are the control signals for the data path. But you also need the control signals for to determine the next state, right, for the microsequencer. So what are those? These are the IRD, COND, and J. So to be able to determine this, we need to look at the microsequencer. And I hope we'll have a microsequencer here. Well, well, we also need to look at the finite state machine. That's why this is fun. Basically, what is the address of the next state? It is 33, right? Unconditional. So first of all, the address of the next state is unconditional. You need to set the con bits such that they indicate an unconditional jump. If you look at uh, the microsequencer or the control signals, where is the microsequencer? You have to, let's switch to this screen. If you look at the microsequencer, unconditional jump is indicated if you set the con 1 and con 0 to 0, 0. Right? So these should be 0, 0. It's an unconditional jump to the J bits, which means that if you look at the microsequencer, we're not decoding the instruction yet. We haven't even fetched it yet. So IRD should be set to, well, you need to look at the convention. What does the convention say? So IRD. No, yes. No means zero. Yes is one. Yes means you're decoding an instruction. So if this is no. We're not decoding an instruction. So IRD should be set to zero. And J bit should be set to 33, right? If you look over there, the next state is 33 at the top. Oh. So what is 33? As we've seen before, it's this, right? That's it. That's your micro instruction, all of it, for state 18. Make sense? It's pretty simple, right? What is the convention to store X in the control store? Well, you can... You can just store an X, right? You can do that. Don't care. And the logic can, well, it doesn't matter, actually. <laughs> you can put 0 or 1, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay? Any questions? Okay. Okay. So let's do it for state 19. I don't think I want to do it for, for the entire thing. But you got the idea, right? It's pretty simple, actually, once you know how the data path operates. 
You do something like this in uh, single cycle design also, except you don't fill out the micro, uh, micro instruction. It's not, there's no control store in the design that you're designing uh, for your lab. It's kind of, yeah? That's right, exactly. You just assert those signals with hardwired control. Whereas here, we're more methodical, if you will. And we'll see the benefits of this soon. So let's look at states. Oh, wait, I said state 33, yes. So state 33, what does it do? Uh, I guess I have it over here, so I'm not going to go through the state machine again, just to minimize the number of hands I need. So what it does is, you wait for memory, basically. Memory eventually responds by putting the data into the MDR. So where does this happen? If you look at the bottom part of the data path, and autofocus somehow, I guess it didn't focus. Can you guys see it? No? Why is it focused? Is it better? Okay. Technology. <laughs> yes, basically what's going to happen is memory, this mess, will somehow respond by placing the data into the MDR. Which means that we'd better enable MDR, right? Load MDR. Uh, we, we'd better write enable MDR over here. And we'd better enable memory also, right? Because we're going to access memory. So there is a mess over here, which we will briefly discuss, which will become clear when you read Appendix C. But you actually do the MIO enable signal over here. Do you enable memory or IO? And this memory ena mem enable signal gets generated based on the address as well as the MIO enable. Because you're enabling either the memory, this part, or the IO part. And which part you're enabling really depends on the address that you're accessing. Okay. If the program counter is actually accessing an address, that's mapped to I.O., well, then this memory enable will, be, will become zero and you'll actually select what's coming from here. Well, normally, you don't load the program counter from an I.O. device, right? I guess you could. Why not? It's not, it's not impossible, right? If you're loading from a USB, for example, you could design a system that actually does this. But in this case, we need to set memory I.O. enable to 1 and hope that the logic over here implements the right thing such that memory gets enabled. There's also a read-write bit. We're reading from memory, right? We're not writing to memory. So memory should be read. Uh, this write-enable logic is for alignment. In this case, we're word-aligned. Basically, we're loading a word. And that's it. Let's see. And this is the MIO enable signal over here. So MDR should get its, its value from memory, not, for, not from this bus, which means that MIO enable should select this part, right? If you, look, if you follow this, this is really coming from somewhere in memory, I hope. Yeah, this is the memory's output, and you need to select this one. And address control logic does that automatically once you enable memory IO enable. Uh, and MIO enable should be set over here because the, the value is coming from uh, memory or I.O. Okay, now that I've introduced what's happening, now let's see how, how we'll make this happen. Load MDR. We should be loading MDR. Oh, okay. You can see it, right? Load MDR is set to zero, uh, set to one, and we're not loading any other register. If you look at the state machine description, no other register should be harmed, including the program count. We're not gating anything on the bus, right? Are we gating MDR? No. We're no, we're not gating MDR. So gate MDR, if you look at gate MDR, it's taking the value of MDR and gating it onto the bus. Now we're, there's a path from memory going to MDR through here, if you look over here. So we need to take this path. We don't want to take this path. Well, we don't want to take this path, okay? So really, gating, none of the, nothing is gated on the bus, really. You can think about it by just following the paths that you need to take in the entire machine. PC mocks, we're not doing anything with the PC mocks. Actually, I did zeros over here, but it's actually X's, right? I'm not going to change that right now. It's really, <laughs> it's really don't care. Because you can load stuff on the bus, sure, No, load PCs cannot be X's, right? Because they, they change the state. I mean, they may be X's later on in the grand scheme of things, but I don't, I don't want to deal with that right now. But if you load something, if you gate something on the bus, it doesn't matter in this cycle, right? 
As long as you do no harm, as long as no register latches it, not a problem. So these should really be X's over here, the gating signals. Of course, you, there may be reasons why you don't want to gate this, right? Energy is one example. Power is one example. Yeah, so you need to ensure that that doesn't happen. You're, you're absolutely right. As long as it doesn't cause electrical problems because you're trying to drive the bus with multiple values, this is okay. But to be safe, I guess you can do zeros. <laughs> okay, PC marks, again, don't care because you're not actually gating the PC eventually. I'm sorry, you're not loading the PC eventually, so it doesn't matter what you do with the PC mux over here. Uh, same as the other muxes over here. Well, let's see. Yeah, that is true, actually. MIO enable should be 1, and we're reading from memory. I, I believe read is a 0. And to be able to look at this, yeah, read is a 0. The first one is always the lower value, 0, 1, 0, 3. Okay, data size. So that's important because this, is, this determines the data size that you're reading from memory. It could be a byte, it could be a word. And in this case, we're reading a word because all instructions are word reads. Uh, so we find the data size value. We set it to 1 because it's a word read. And left shift 1, it doesn't matter. This is basically some control uh, signal that's needed in the address computation, which you will need to do. So this is this logic over here, left shift 1. Do you actually do left shift one or do you not do left shift one, basically? Okay, that's it, right? This is simple also. And I think we've actually already talked about how to set the bits for this state. So 33, the unconditional next state, if it, uh, the, the next state, the, the state is conditional. It's conditional on the R bits, right? And we're definitely not decoding the instructions. So let's set the IRD to zero because this is not the decode state. Condition is really, if you look at condition, we're really testing for this condition. So it should be 0, 1, because we're testing for the memory ready condition. And J bits should really be, if, if, if the condition doesn't hold, we stay in this state, which is number 33 over there. So J bits should really specify 33. And we've gone through this exercise actually earlier, right? If the condition holds, then what happens is ready bit evaluates the 1. And these, this, uh, the result of this AND gate evaluates to 1. This is 0, this is 1. So you get a 1 over here, and nothing else changes. So you, get, you go to state 35. OK? Simple. Shall we do one more state, or are we done? One more? Who wants one more? <laughs> Say it again? You want to do decode? That's easy. OK, decode is really easy. Well, let's do, the, I, let's do the next state very, very quickly uh, so, so that we can actually fetch and decode instructions and then, and then we can do decode because decode is really, really easy. Let's do state 35. State 35, if you look at it, the only thing that needs to happen is MDR goes into IR. So how is that done in the data path? Basically, we have stuff in the MDR now. MDR goes into, where's IR? IR is here. So you're actually exercising only this part of the data path, which is kind of nice. Well, it's kind of an inefficiency also, actually, as we will see. You, you have all this hardware, and you're not using it for some other purpose. You're re reducing concurrency. Right? So we need to gate the MDR, and we need to gate the entire MDR. So this is for alignment, as I discussed earlier. In this case, we have a full word. So data size, in this case, stays as a word. right? So data size should be set to 1. Gate MDR should be set to 1. Load IR should be, should be set to 1. And for the rest, we do no harm. Since we're gating something onto the bus, we'd better gate everything else. To, we'd better set all of the other gate signals to zero, right? And we better set all of the other load signals to zero. So now you've got it, I think. Load IR is one. All of the other load signals are zero because otherwise we would do some harm. And we are gating MDR. And all of the other gate signals should be zero because otherwise we'll get junk on the bus. And now we don't care, PC mux, ER mux, address 1 mux, address 2 mux, because we're not really using that part of the data path, and we're ensuring that those don't affect the state uh, by setting the load and gate signals to 0. Am I enabled? Is it enabled? It's not enabled anymore, right? Because we already got the data from, uh, we already got the data in MDR. There's no reason to access memory. The state doesn't access memory. 
This is state 35, if you remember, this one. So MIO is not enabled, which means that read write actually can be X because read write is not used anywhere other than this part. But the data size is important because it affects this alignment logic over here. So we'll set that to one. And left shift is also an X. And next state is really simple actually because next state, if you look at it, it's unconditionally state 32, right? So unconditional jump, condition bits are set to zero, IRD is set to zero, and 32 is this. That's it, that's your microcode for this state, micro instruction. And you wanted the decode. The next state is really decode, and I'll do that really easily. That's really easy, right? Well, I guess there, there's some uh, interesting thing going on. So BEN, basically BEN is set over here. So we need to load BEN. What is, what is BEN? That's the branch enable logic, right? It's actually not shown in the data path, but it's shown in this supplementary figure. There's some logic that sets the BN, and load BN actually loads that BN register. That's a branch enable logic, so we set that to one. We don't load anything else because the state specifies so. Uh, load PC, clearly not. Are we gating anything on the bus? Again, we don't care, right, because we're not loading. So all of these should be really don't cares or zeros to be safe. And these are all excess, so it's going to be really easy, as I said. Don't do harm to harm in memory. And these are excess because we're not using them. Oh, now you can see. Make sense? And the next state, this is the interesting part of the decode. Now we're actually decoding the instruction, so IRD is set to one, right? And condition, don't care. So if you look at the microsequencer, if you, if you look at the state machine, actually, let's do the state machine first. We're doing the 16-way jump over here. Your next state address is really dependent on IR, top six, uh, top four bits of the IR. So we, we need to select this input. That's why we set IRD to one, which means that nothing here matters. So all of those could be X's, right? So that's, well, okay, how about this? Better? So all of these are X's because it, you don't care. You just get the this input on the max. Okay, so that's it. Now you need to do some number of states. Is there any state which requires multiple loads to be enabled? I, I, I couldn't get that from the Yeah. Picture. That's a good homework question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, but who knows? Well, multiple load load. Well, there's load PC and load MAR, the first state, right? The first state requires it. Multiple gates, definitely not. <laughs> okay. So that's the end of our exercise. So I'll go through. Uh, was this fun? Yeah. Yes? Oh, uh, let's get to it. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you if, if you. if you have any questions, let me know. That's why I want to discuss in the remaining... Two hours. <laughs> I'm just joking. So hopefully we won't take that long. Okay. So this is homework two. You'll write the microcode for. It used to be for the entire LC3B, and when I fix this, there's a bug that remained apparently. Now you have some states. The extra credit you'll have micro program MIPS implementation, so you can exercise your creativity. Hopefully over there. And we'll give you extra credits, even if you do uh, some part of it. But you need to have a very good design. Okay, some questions. Uh, I'll go through this relatively quickly. We've actually talked about some of these. What control signals can be stored in the control store versus what control signals have to be generated in the hardwired logic? Basically, what signal cannot be available without passing in the data path? We've already answered this, right? Branch condition, for example. Right? The other signal that's here is actually the address of the memory, right? Uh, whether, it's a, uh, whether, you en whether you enable memory or not, because the address can be memory mapped I.O. and you enable the I.O. device in that case. Right? So that's the other thing that is not present in your MIPS data path. 
So we have variable latency memory, as you've seen in this uh, part, right? The ready signal enables memory read write to execute correctly, right? And we already uh, we already talked about this actually, so I'm going to skip this. But I'll ask the question: Could we have done this in a single cycle microarchitecture? No, right? Because it's not single. You're, you're, you're not waiting for multiple cycles. It has to be asynchronous in a single cycle microarchitecture, which is very hard to design. Okay, I think we've covered this. So how can you implement a complex instruction using this control structure? That's one other interesting. Now, now we'll get to why it's microprogramming. You can actually do microprogramming for repeat move S. Basically, add more states, add more micro instructions, and that's your new program portion, if you will, for repeat move S, which you will also do for your homework. So basically, what we've done, this kind of machine provides you a power, uh, a new level of abstraction, right? The concept of having a control store of micro instructions enables the hardware designer to do microprogramming. And that's really an abstraction, if you will. The designer can now translate any desired operation to a sequence of micro instructions. So if you think about an instruction, it's now a sequence of micro instructions, right? You follow a sequence of micro instructions to execute an instruction. Now you can implement anything. Fibonacci, you can actually add it, a sequence of micro instructions, right? You may need to add some more control signals. You may need to add some more data path elements, assuming they're not already there. But you can actually do this. And assuming all of the data path elements are there, you can actually translate anything into this, which is really nice. So all the designer needs to provide is the sequence of micro instructions needed to implement the operation. The ability for the control logic to correctly sequence through the micro instructions, so you may need to change the micro sequence a little bit, and any additional data path control signals needed. And if the operation can be translated into the existing control signals directly without requiring anything new, well, you're golden, right? You can actually add a new instruction without changing your machine. So that gives you a lot of power. So this is what you will do, actually, in your homework. Implement repeat move S in the LC3D microarchitecture. You may need to make changes to the state machine, clearly, to the data path, to the control store, to the microsequencer, and give us your design. It's actually up, already up in homework, too. OK, a few things very quickly. Uh, there's alignment correction in, in, the, uh, uh, in the LC3B. It does byte load and byte store instructions that move data not aligned at the word address boundary. This enables, this gives convenience to the programmer or the compiler, right? The compiler doesn't need to do this alignment. How does the hardware ensure this works correctly? You should take a look at these states. I'm not going to go through this because we've kind of discussed this actually. Uh, if you look at state, well, I guess I'll need to do this again, huh? If you look at state 29, where's state 29? Load byte. Yeah, it's state 29. If you look at this, it's doing an alignment over here, actually. OK, so you, you need to enable the right logic over there such that you get the bytes at the right place. OK. Well, what, it, what it's doing is basically it's left shifting uh, the, the, the address over here. It's using the MAR 15 through 1. And regardless of whatever address you give at the bottom, at the last bit, because remember, this is bi-addressable, you act, you're actually setting it to 0. But you're loading only one byte. OK. And you can look at states 24 and 17 for store bytes, which are somewhere over here. Where's state 24? OK. State 24 and state 17 over here. So if you, if you look at this, you're actually loading storing uh, only 8 bits. OK. Memory mapped I.O., we already discussed this, actually, so I'm not going to go through this. Uh, actually, we've already discussed all of this. So what are the advantages? I'll, stop, uh, I'll finish with the advantages and disadvantages of microprogram control, and then we'll pick up uh, later on. So the, the beauty of this design is it really allows a very simple design to do very powerful computations by just controlling the data path, by just adding more micro instructions, right? using a sequencer. You can have a really simple data path. Now we actually uh, uh, decouple the control and data from each other. Right? 
Because you can now change the control store independently without changing the hardware underneath. A high level ISA is translated into microcode, a sequence of micro instructions. Remember the translation? What we're doing is really translation in this case. We're really translating an instruction to a sequence of micro instructions. And microcode enables a minimal data path to emulate the ISA. And you can also think of micro instructions as a user invisible ISA. The users don't see it, but maybe some special system, uh, system users can update it. Right? It's pretty cool, actually. That's why it's really microprogramming. You're really doing this translation underneath. And most existing architectures, most existing systems already have this. So x86, for example, does this kind of translation in both AMD and Intel systems. The second benefit is it enables easy extensibility of the ISA. Now you can support a new instruction by just changing the microcode. You can support complex instructions as a sequence of simple instructions, simple micro-instructions. And this is kind of uh, cool also. If I can sequence an arbitrary instruction, then I can sequence an arbitrary program as a microprogram sequence. It's kind of a mouthful, if you will. But basically, you can do any program, any kind of program on top of this micro-instruction store, if you will. You may need to add some new state, for example, loop counters. For example, if you want to do repeat move as string copy, you, you will need to add some loop counters somewhere, right? But that could be part of your micro sequence. In fact, that's how it's exactly implemented in x86 today. If you're doing a repeat, if you're doing a repeat prefix, there's a loop counter that starts in the micro sequencing logic in, in Intel Pentium 4, for example, or other parts, other Intel processors, and goes through its sequences through a loop that is implemented as a sequence of micro instructions. And you'll do that in your assignment. Okay. This is my last slide, and then I'll stop. So the ability to update and patch microcode in the field enables a lot of nice things. It, enable, it gives you the ability to add new instructions without changing the processor. You can actually send a patch uh, into the field and update the microcode. Ability to fix buggy hardware implementations. If you find that uh, something is buggy, maybe you change the microcode a little bit, right? Update the microcode, if you have that ability. There's, there are historical examples. Today, it's, it's possible to do also, but IBM 370 model 145, for example, microcode is stored in main memory. So you can think of all of this in main memory, not in a special hardware structure, and can be updated after a reboot. After a reboot, you can change the state behavior of the machine. That's pretty cool, right? System Z was similar to this one, IBM System Z. And there's a nice paper that describes this, actually, that was written in 2004. They call this the millicode. Remember the Burroughs 1700? I briefly discussed that. It was a bit addressable machine. And the, the goal was to actually emulate any possible behavior. Well, if you want to emulate any possible behavior, you may want to do this also. This was a kind of crazy in a sense. You can update the microcode while the processor is actually running. You can basically change the implementation of the instructions. You can think of it as a user microprogrammable machine. Now you're really exposing this as a user. Well, it may be a supervisor. <coughs> But it's still a user. Now that microcode is really part of your ISA in this case, right? Which is pretty interesting. Okay, I think I'll stop here, uh, but we'll pick up here and then start pipelining in the next lecture.